Everyone ready? <laughs> okay, good. Uh, so, uh, someone just gave me a first aid kit because they were concerned about, I know who it, who it was actually, uh, got it because I had some cuts on my legs, uh, so I got a first aid kit. <laughs> but actually those cuts, it's very, very sweet. You know, when you are a monk, people look after you like you are a little baby. Yeah, they really look after you. Everything is kind of looked after, which is very, very nice. But uh, those cuts are actually from Perth because in Perth we work in the forest. Uh, yeah, I, I work in the forest. I like working in the forest. So you can always get a few bruises and things. So that's very, but that's very kind of you. Yeah. So uh, I, just, I was just joking to lie that when I go back to Perth, I will weigh a few extra kilos when I go back to Perth. <laughs> just after the meal, I told them. <laughs> so are you going to weigh a few extra kilos, Venerable, as well? Or are, you, are you okay? Yeah? No. <laughs> I'm just joking. Joking around. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. Good. Uh, so let us uh, continue with the uh, uh, suttas. Uh, and uh, I'm going to continue. These are some of the things I have talked about already. But I like to talk about this on every sutta retreat because these are some of the core reflections in Buddhism. And what we talk about this morning was. Uh, in many ways it's quite profound and, and often you know, people think that, oh, you know, this is the Anapanasati Sutta, I'm not even the 16 steps, uh, I'm not even sure if I have arrived at step one yet. Uh, that's what people sometimes think, yeah. And uh, some they feel a bit kind of, oh, you know, what, what can we do? But uh, the idea with the Anapanasati Sutta is to give you just a map, a road map, so you know where you're heading and what do you, what do you have to do. And uh, some of you will already be somewhere on that map. Some of you may think you haven't even started yet, uh, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, these are profound teachings. They have a, there's a long way to go. Uh, and one of the things it does when you read about this, it kind of lifts you up and you feel inspired because there's so much wonderful things to happen on this, this Buddhist path. Uh, and if you have got a little bit of happiness, uh, you've got more happiness to look forward to. If you already have more happiness, you've got even more happiness to look forward to. If you've got even more happiness, uh, then there's even more. It's like it never ends, yeah, until you kind of, kind of blow out of the stratosphere and you kind of, you don't, you don't know what you're going to do. And you, like Anna Brahm says, there comes a point, you don't know if you can take any more happiness, yeah, it's just, <laughs> it's just so much. Uh, isn't that kind of amazing? Uh, it's kind of remarkable, this Buddhist path. Uh, so it's one way, just making you feel inspired by these amazing teachings and the potential of the path. Uh, and it keeps you, uh, you know, interested in these things. Uh, and then as long as you make a little bit of progress, uh, every year, every month you make a little bit of progress, uh, then you will be heading towards all of these things. Uh. And this is the most encouraging thing of all. The really encouraging thing is when you feel that you're actually heading somewhere. Uh, you're actually moving towards these marvelous insights and happinesses and, and all of these things that the Buddhist path uh, has, is kind of waiting for us. Uh. So, but to be able to get there uh, and to be able to support this path, there's a, a large number of other things that uh, are useful uh, and very uh, suitable for this. And these are some of the things I will talk about now. So I've kind of started on the top, now I'm going to backtrack uh, yeah, and look at some of the supports for how to get to these more profound things. Uh. And um, one of these uh, important things, uh, and I've talked about this a little bit already, uh, and this is like the contemplation of death and some of the contemplations around that uh, uh, to support uh, kind of the mindfulness and support all the other good qualities uh, uh, that we need to develop to get there. Uh. And this particular uh, sutta that I have picked out is one that I read very often uh, on the retreats. Uh, it's called Themes. And it talks about five different kind of reflections that are good to do on a fairly regular basis to remind you of, uh, uh, of the path and uh, what to do. So this is how it goes on page 65 in our little booklet. Uh, and uh, uh, because uh, there are these five themes that should often be reflected upon uh, by a woman or a man, by a householder or one gone forth. So this is already uh, an unusual start. Here it specifically says that it is for a householder or one going forth uh, by a woman or a man. So here specifically everyone is included. Huh? So you know that this is a teaching for everyone. Huh? What five? A woman or a man, a householder or one going forth should often reflect thus. I am subject to old age. I am not exempt from old age. A woman or a man, a householder, one gone forth, should often reflect 
Thus, uh, I'm subject to illness. Uh, I'm not exempt from illness. Uh, a woman or a man, a householder, or one gone forth should often reflect thus. Uh, I'm subject to death. I'm not exempt from death. Uh, a woman or a man, a householder, or one gone forth should often reflect thus. Uh, I must be parted and separated from everyone and everything dear and agreeable to me. Uh, a woman or a man, a householder, or one gone forth, should often reflect thus. I am the owner of my kamma, the heir of my kamma. I have kamma as my origin, kamma as my relative, kamma as my resort. I will be the heir of whatever kamma, good or bad, that I do. So that is the summary of these five. And uh, one of the kind of nice little things that is interesting uh, here is that uh, you see, it says a woman or a man. In this case, it has the woman first, uh, which is not so not so common in the suttas. Yeah, sometimes the suttas seem to be very kind of male-centered, uh, which uh, we should remember is uh, natural because the Buddha would have talked to the monks most of the time, and the monks were the most senior disciples of the Buddha. So it's kind of natural. But this is one of those places where uh, uh, where actually women comes first, uh, which is kind of a nice, just for a change, just to see that the suttas aren't 100% one-sided, yeah? So that's kind of useful. Uh. <laughs> so, uh, and, um, yeah, so that is the summary, and this is how the Buddha often teaches. He teaches by summarizing the teaching first, uh, and then he gives it in detail afterwards. Uh, it's just a very useful way of teaching. Uh, especially in an oral tradition, uh, but even if it, when they're written down, it is handy to see it in this way. Uh. So, uh, let us have a look at each one of these five. I may, uh, I'm not sure how long I will spend on each one, because we have already had a look at it, uh, but just as a matter of repetition. Uh. For the sake of what benefit should a woman or a man, uh, a householder or one gone forth, often reflect thus? Uh. I am subject to old age. I am not exempt from old age. In their youth, beings are intoxicated with their youth. And when they are intoxicated with their youth, they engage in misconduct by body, speech and mind. But when one often reflects upon this theme, the intoxication with youth is either completely abandoned or diminished. It is for the sake of this benefit that a woman or a man, a householder or one gone forth, should often reflect thus. I am subject to old age. I am not exempt from old age. So uh, again, as I pointed out last time, the idea of intoxication in Buddhism is a very broad one. Of course, you get intoxicated by alcohol, you get intoxicated by uh, you know, drugs and these kind of things, and of course that can make you very heedless. But it's not just that those intoxications. Intoxications are much broader than that. Uh, and one of the intoxications in Buddhism is just sensu sensual pleasures. Uh, yeah, you get intoxicated with sensual pleasures uh, and you get heedless about what's happening around you. Uh, and then you have the intoxications of being alive, of being healthy, of thinking, yeah, yeah I can do whatever I want. Uh, and then you do whatever you want. And that was kind of the problem. You shouldn't have been doing whatever you want. You should be doing whatever is wise instead. Uh, because sometimes the things we want are not really useful. Uh. And uh, it's often it's very short term rather than long term, uh, the things that we end up doing in life. Uh. And when you have a big uh, outlook like this, the, we see things from a larger point of view, from a bird's eye perspective, uh, you're able to restrain uh, some of those wants uh, that are short term uh, and instead think about things in the long term uh, uh, instead. Uh. And uh, this I think is a very important ability, this ability to say no to some of the short term happinesses uh, so we can kind of go for the long term happinesses instead. Uh. And uh, you may have heard as a very interesting experiment uh, uh, that was done, uh, uh, I think, probably in the United States, that's really where these things are done. <laughs> and uh, it's, done, uh, it's a while ago now, but it was about what they call experiment on delayed gratification. And delayed gratification is what is the idea that they had little young children, I don't know how old they were, maybe three or four years old or five or something like that, uh, and they gave them a sweet, yeah, and they say that, well, Here's a sweet, uh, and uh, you can either eat it, uh, or if you don't eat it, uh, and you wait 15 minutes, you can have another one. Uh, yeah? So you can either have two if you wait 15 minutes, or you can eat this one straight away, and then you don't get another one. Uh. And those children who were 
able to resist yeah, that first sweet. They were the ones who got the second one, huh? so they ended up with two sweets. Uh, and then there were those children who were not able to resist, and so they ate that one sweet and they only got one. Huh? And it turned out that uh, they followed up on these children later in life, and it turned out that those children who were able to resist, uh, they call this delayed the gratification, they delay the kind of the, the, the pleasure. Uh, they are the ones who turned out to be more successful in life in general, uh, in terms of happiness, in terms of balance in life, in terms of even in terms of you know holding down a job in a good way and having success with a. Uh, in, in, in all sorts of worldly ways, of course, as it was measured in worldly ways, uh, they were the successful ones. Uh. And it's the same thing on the spiritual path. Uh. If you're going to have success, uh, you're going to have this feeling of delayed gratification. Yeah? You have to wait. The happiness sometimes doesn't come immediately. Uh, and you have to, this is what the idea of morality is based on. Uh. You stop yourself from doing something bad, uh, but in the long run it has tremendous uh, beneficial effects. Uh. So this is like one of the kind of things, one of the fundamental things in life that uh, make you either a successful person or not in whatever area that you are focusing on. Uh. So, um, uh, and these things help you with that delayed gratification because when you have a, uh, when you are wise about these things, uh, when you reflect about these things in the right way, then it helps you to stop uh, and to do, uh, avoid those silly things that uh, you, you actually know you shouldn't be doing. Uh. Is it a good idea to turn the air conditioning on? Uh? Is, that, is that a good idea? Or, uh, is, are, are people cold or are they... Uh, are you uh, you're warm? Uh, yeah? Okay. So maybe we can, maybe we can do that. Uh. I like minus 10, you know, so I really... <laughs> 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 Okay, wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, okay. So, uh, uh, and this, so this is how you, this is one of the things you do. You remember uh, you're going to be old. And one of the ways of thinking about this that I usually point out is to remember that uh, uh, it is as if the old age is already inside of you. Uh, we're all going to have to become old. Uh, one day is going to happen. It's already inside of you. It's already there. It's waiting to come out in a way you are already old. Yeah, because you have to go there, there is no choice, uh, it's already in you. Huh? So it's already part of you. Huh? So when you, uh, you know, when you remember that, it's already part of you, only waiting to come out, uh, suddenly one day you wake up and there you are, you're older. Yeah, it happened. Uh, yeah, it's a bit like that. It's like you go through this kind of whole blur and bang, oop, I'm old now. Huh? And, <laughs> and we forgot about that. Uh, and, uh, but so bring that into your consciousness now, yeah? It's already part of you. We have already probably been old many, many times before. Uh, and every time we have been a little bit shocked by the problems of being old, yeah? Because we forget about it, forget what this is like. Uh. And then uh, you don't become so proud, you don't become so deluded uh, by your youthfulness and by kind of feeling strong and feeling you can do whatever you like in the world. Uh, you don't allow that intoxication to carry you away because it's already part of you. Uh. And this idea of, uh, so when you see an old person uh, and you see that they are really sick and they have really so many problems, uh, you kind of look at them and you see yourself there. Uh. You kind of put your face onto their face and you think, that, that could be me, that will be me one day. Uh, I will be like this. Uh. And it feels a bit Sometimes it feels a bit kind of hard to s hard to bear because it's it is unpleasant, yeah. Being so old that you have to be cared for by other people, uh, you can't do very much by on your own anymore. You lose your independence and all of these things. Many of the things that we treasure in life they are uh, they are kind of hijacked by old age, uh, and you can no longer do those things. So it's kind of a bit unbearable. Uh. So it's good to get used to that thought straight away. There is this person. Uh, I have the same nature. I will be just like that. Uh. That is me, probably, right there. I will be like this. Uh, and then you kind of uh, uh, overcome some of the, you get clarity inside. Uh, and this is what these uh, reflections are all about. Uh, you feel that if you do them in the right way, your mind clears up. Uh, yeah, you gain more clarity. Uh, this is one of the meanings of the word vipassana. We talk about vipassana meditation, but vipassana just means clarity, clear seeing. You see things clearly. Anything that reduces the defilements, uh, that gives you more clarity about the purpose in life, uh, about what is right and what is wrong and all of these things, uh, that is vipassana. Uh. Vipassana is in the suttas, it's not a meditation technique. In the modern way of talking about 
uh, vipassana, we're talking about vipassana as a meditation technique, but in the suttas it's more like a state of mind that comes from right practice. Uh, the clarity, the understanding that, uh, of things in the right way, uh, that is vipassana in the suttas. Uh, so better translation would be clear seeing than actually insight, which is the common translation used these days, uh, I think. Uh, I wrote to Bhikkhu Bodhi, I said, said to Bhikkhu, I said, well, you know, why are we calling this inside? That doesn't really make sense. And I gave him a few examples from the suttas, and he replied to me. You know what he replied? Uh, he said, I agree here. <laughs> but, there's always a but, right? Uh, and the but was, we are so used to using insight, we've got to stick with it, because that's kind of what we're used to doing. Yeah, that's what he said, that was the argument. Uh, and he has a point, yeah? So, uh, anyway, so that is the idea of... Uh, of uh, all the hate. It's already part of you. Huh? And, um, yeah, so uh, uh, tr see what you can make of that particular uh, uh, contemplation and remember that all of these things are reflections and contemplations uh, that you need to do every now and again for it to really be effective. Huh? If you do it once or twice or only once a year when you come here or whatever, then it's not <laughs> It's not going to be as effective as if you do it, you know, occasionally. You remind yourself, yeah? Whenever you see an old person, you see yourself in that person. And then you know that how real it is. And there's something also very nice about seeing yourself in other people. Huh? When you see yourself in other people, huh, it's much more difficult to discriminate or to divide people apart. You know, these are other, I am like this, they are like that. Uh, when you see someone who is old, it's very easy not to treat them exactly like other people. But so to treat everyone the same, it's very good to remember that you too have been in that state. And this is very useful, for example, if you are, when you talk about gender differences between men and women, uh, if you remember that probably, uh, if you're a man, you've been a woman in the past, or if you're a woman, you've been a man in the past, uh, in the future, we may again change around again. Uh, if you remember that these things are already part of you, it's already inside, it's waiting to come out, yeah? Next life, who knows what the kind of, how we, what we're gonna be. Huh? And if you think like that, it reduces that gap or difference between us, uh, and we feel more empathy for each other, more understanding, yeah? It's a wonderful thing to do, or between rich and poor, exactly the same, yeah? This life you may be comfortable and at ease, but in past lives you have probably been very poor. Occasionally, once in a million lives, you may have been very rich. But it's very rare, right? Let's face it, very rare that you become really, really wealthy or whatever. So, but we've all been there. So when you see someone who's poor, when you see someone who is very sick, when you see someone who is very stupid and not unintelligent, this life you may be reasonably intelligent, but in the past you've probably been really thick. <laughs> yeah, we've all been there. So have compassion for people who are stupid, yeah. Have, have compassion for people who are not able to get all A's on their grades. Sometimes we demand of our children, I only want to see A's from school. But sometimes you just can't do it uh, because of the background or whatever we have. Uh. And then you have compassion for everyone because it's already inside of you. Uh. It's already waiting to come out. Uh. Or religions, exactly the same thing. Uh. We have probably been Muslims in the past life or Christians or atheists or Hindus or worshipping Thor and Odin. Yeah, I probably worshipped Thor, Thor and Odin in my past life. <laughs> I probably didn't actually. I was probably a Buddhist in my past life. But anyway, I kind of... So, so again, we have compassion for them, uh, because they are what they are, uh, and they are, have been conditioned in the way they are. Uh, or different nationalities, uh, different races, yeah? I always think that I was a Buddhist in a past life. Well, if I was a Buddhist monk or Buddhist nun, perhaps, uh, perhaps I was a Buddhist nun in my past life, uh, where would, would, would that have been? I would have been in Asia, yeah? So I would probably was a monk, may maybe here in Malaysia, but probably more likely in maybe Sri Lanka or Thailand or something like that. Uh. And once you start to see yourself in all of these different positions, yeah, as being any of these nationalities, any of these religions, high status, low status, rich, poor, educated, stupid, intelligent, all of these things, uh, how, can you, how can you treat people differently? Uh, how can you discriminate? Uh, yeah? And it's a very beautiful way of universalizing the human experience. Uh, we're all human beings, that's what it comes down to. Uh, we should all treat each other with respect and with kindness. Uh, that's the only thing that makes any sense. Uh, so this is part of this, uh, in a sense, this reflection here, because old age, old people are often people also get a bit discriminated against, because once you get old, you kind of get dismissed, yeah, yeah, whatever, you, you help them, but you may not uh, take so much interest in them anymore. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, that's the first one. Let's go on to the uh, second one. Yeah. 
And for the sake of what benefit should a woman or a man, a householder or one gone forth, often reflect thus? I am subject to illness. I am not exempt from illness. In a state of health, being are intoxicated with their health. And when they are intoxicated with their health, they engage in misconduct by body, speech and mind. And when one often reflects upon this theme, the intoxication with health is either completely abandoned or diminished. It is for the sake of this benefit that a woman or a man, a householder or one gone forth, should often reflect thus. I am subject to illness. I am not exempt from illness. So, a, a very similar to the previous one, yeah, illness is a very unpleasant thing. I, I, was, uh, I had a few days of illness not so long ago, a few months ago, and I thought, gee, I've been ill for so long, I've forgotten what it feels like. And it feels really terrible when you have a fever and you kind of just have to lie down on bed, you don't want to do anything. It feels, it feels really terrible. Uh, and uh, then I r reminded myself, but this is actually what Ajahn Brahm keeps saying, yeah, nothing has gone wrong. Uh, so this is actually right. Uh, then I felt even worse when I thought this is right, because... Uh, <laughs> so, but it, this, is, this is true, yeah, when you feel sick, and this is one of the things that makes life miserable, that actually sickness is right. Uh, yeah, it's supposed to be like this. This is part and parcel of the uh, thing, of the kind of the idea of, uh, of, of, of life. Uh, and uh, so this is a dukkha for you, big time, and I was reminded of that, that recently, what that feels like. Yeah. So it's good to have these things occasionally, otherwise you forget about it. Uh. So remember that, uh, yeah, and uh, it takes away, again, the intoxication and makes you more realistic about what life is like. Yeah. Next one. And for the sake of what benefit should a woman or a man, a householder or one, gone forth, often reflect thus? Uh, I'm subject to death. I'm not exempt from death. During their lives, beings are intoxicated with life. And when they are intoxicated with life, they engage in misconduct by body, speech and mind. And when one often reflects upon this theme, the intoxication with life is completely abandoned or diminished. It is for the sake of this benefit that a woman or a man, a householder or one gone forth, should often reflect thus. I am subject to death, I am not exempt from death. And uh, this is uh, one of those very spiritual reflections to remind yourself of death, any kind of spiritual tradition which has any depth to it at all, uh, death contemplation is part of that. Uh, and uh, of course the whole point of the death contemplation is to put life in context, yeah, to remember what life is like, to make it, to make every moment more precious, because you don't know what's going to happen in the future. Uh, and uh, this is very much like that uh, simile, I think we mentioned that before already, the simile of the glass, yeah, that Ajahn Shah used to uh, say, I have uh, the, the simile that he used f with his monks. He took a glass in his hand and lifted it up and said to the monks, uh, can you see the crack in this glass? And the monks looked at it, no, can't see the crack in that glass. Well, it is there, because one day this glass will fall down uh, and it will shatter in a thousand pieces. Uh, the glass is impermanent, uh, it is unstable, it is uncertain. Uh, and in exactly the same way, our lives are fragile, just like a glass. Uh, one day we will shatter, we will die, uh, and that will be the end of things. Uh, so because that glass is fragile, we care for it, uh, we look after it, we make sure that it doesn't fall down and shatter straight away. Yeah? We put it down gently, we don't just throw it down as if it was a rubber, rubber ball or something like that. Uh, and in the same thing, way, when you understand that life is fragile, uh, you start to treat people better. Uh, you treat them with more kindness uh, because you don't know when they're going to pass away. Uh, and this is the thing that always became so obvious to me that if I know that someone, I could die at any time, the other person could die at any time, uh, then how are you going to treat those people if, they're gonna, if you might never see them again? Uh, yeah, if this is the last time I see you all, am I going to treat you badly or am I going to be kind of try to be kind and reasonable? Uh, yeah, when you see someone for the last time, you don't want to treat them badly. That's the last thing you want to do. Uh, and the death contemplation reminds you to treat people with kindness at all times. Uh, there is never any time to have uh, be enemies with people. Yeah, there's no, there is no time for that. There is no possibility. Once you understand the idea of death, uh, you can never really be enemies with other people. Uh, and this is kind of the beautiful thing about this recollection. Uh. But to make it real, one of the things that you 
have to do is to kind of give yourself some examples of how you can die. And this is one of the things the Buddha does in the suttas. Uh, and he sort of reminds you that, you know, suddenly you kind of walk along and you get bitten by a snake. I guess here in, here in uh, KL, in the city, there's not that many snakes. I was hoping when I went with Bobby yesterday, went out walking, I was hoping to see some snakes, but we didn't see any snakes. That was really unfortunate because it kind of, when you see a snake, it kind of, oh, it makes you feel straight away a little bit of fear of death, yeah, because that's what snakes do. They kind of get that fear into you. So it's good to see snakes every now and again, uh, yeah, as long as you don't get bitten, right? Uh, <laughs> at least see them, yeah, so you have that kind of sho slight shock uh, to the system. Uh, and in Australia, we have very poisonous snakes, uh, yeah, everywhere. Uh, and it's, it's occasional to read about people in the paper who die because of snake bite. Uh, remember, that could be you. When you read about someone else who has been bitten by a snake and dies, that could be you. There's no reason why it shouldn't be you. Especially as a monk in our monastery, we walk around in nature all the time. And I sometimes I've almost stepped on snakes. That, oh, wait a minute, that's a snake. Okay, back. <laughs> and usually the snakes are much more afraid than you are, so it's not an issue. Huh? But uh, uh, sometimes you do make a mistake, yeah? And you step on the snake. And uh, I read a newspaper report about a man who was bitten by a tiny little snake. Yeah? But apparently that makes no difference. If the snake is tiny, the venom is just as bad, uh, yeah? So he thought, yeah, just a tiny snake, whatever. Uh, half an hour later, he was dead. Uh, yeah? Tiny snakes are, are bad news. So this is the nature of life. Uh, you go down in the street, you know, cars are much more dangerous than snakes. Let's face it, uh, yeah? So you go down into the street, bang, then uh, you, you've had it already. Uh, uh, you have diseases uh, are already inside of you, uh, waiting to come out. Uh, yeah, so I don't know, you have maybe have family members who are sick with cancer. I've got a couple of family members who are sick with cancer. And so again, I always wonder, well, if my family members are sick with cancer, I have you know, similar genetic makeup. Uh, is it anywhere in here? Uh, you know, and m maybe it is, uh, yeah, just waiting in here somewhere to come out. Uh. And it kind of reminds you of the reality of these things. Uh. The Buddha has this nice little sutta where he talks about uh, uh, the keenness of people's faculties, the ability to grasp these things. Uh, and um, uh, he starts off with a person who all they do is they re hear about someone who has died uh, and straight away think, oh, someone has died. And then they kind of get slightly worried and concerned uh, and they start practicing the path as a consequence. So every day, you, do you read, everyone here read the paper? Uh, every day? Newspaper? Yeah? You read the newspaper and always have the death, you know, the death column, people who have died. Uh, so whenever you read about the deaths in the newspaper, uh, that could be you. Yeah, remember that. That should kind of shock you a little bit into kind of reality straight away. Bang, okay, that could be me. Uh. But most people don't get that because we, it's too far away from us. So. So most people need maybe a, uh, a, a relative, not, m may have to see someone who has died. Yeah, that is more powerful. Uh. But sometimes that isn't even enough because even that is too far away. Uh. So I need a relative to get very ill or die. That's when it kind of kind of happens, yeah? But for some people that even doesn't work. Sometimes you have to get close to death, yeah? You have to have some kind of illness. Uh, and that often works for people. If you come close to death, uh, then very often that has a very powerful impact on people. Uh. But then there are those people who even then don't really get it, yeah? Uh, and then of course there's not much you can do. Uh. So uh, try to be one of those. Uh, whenever you hear about someone who dies, uh, then remind yourself, this could be me, I could be in the same situation. So these are little ways of just kind of helping you with the death recollection. Uh, one of the things that the Buddha says, if you really want to do that death recollection fully, uh, you should be ready to die on the next breath. <laughs> it's quite difficult, isn't it? Uh, it's quite hard to be ready on the next breath. Uh. It's kind of almost it's a bit scary for most people to be ready to die on the next breath. One of these days is going to happen. I'm going to be sitting on stage, I'm going to be breathing, and then bang, you know, going to be dead. So, um, uh, and this, so this is uh, this death contemplation. Uh, and uh, of course, what happens uh, when you do this death contemplation properly, uh, it kind of sets the priorities very straight. Uh, when you have, uh, like I mentioned the other day, if you have the death contemplation properly, uh, you will tend not to get angry with people, uh, you tend not to have any ill will. Uh, if you are lying on your deathbed uh, and you're about to die, uh, then 
you're not going to be want to be angry with anyone. Yeah, you're not going to want you want to be peaceful. Huh? You want to be ready to die. Huh? If someone else wants to argue with you, actually they probably won't argue with you on your deathbed anyway. But you just you just don't want to have anything to do with that. Huh? You want to go somewhere else. Huh? If also you're not going to have any desires because there's nothing really to desire anymore. Huh? So one of the nice ways, what happens when you think about this? Uh, it is as if your future is gone. Huh? So if you are about to die, no more future. Huh? I don't have a future. Huh? That's kind of a nice thought, especially for meditation practice. Uh, if you have no future anymore, uh, because the future is uh, uh, so uncertain anyway, uh, then of course uh, that all that thing about thinking about the future, thinking about what's going to happen next, what you have to do tomorrow, all of that is wiped out, uh, and all you have is the present moment left, uh, and then becomes can become very peaceful. Uh. So we try to get to that state where many people who are dying uh, already are. When you see someone who dies well, very often they become very peaceful. Uh, so we try to bring that into the present moment. Uh, and uh, the only time to be ready to die is now. Uh. Yeah, if you say that, oh yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll be ready when it happens, uh, then you're not going to be ready. Uh. Now is the time to be ready to, to die. So if you're ready now, then you will be ready when it happens. Uh, if you're not ready now, it is unlikely you will be ready when it happens. Uh, now is the time to practice these things. Uh. So that is the idea. So you can see here that how the death contemplation can be so beautiful. Uh, it makes you, uh, it helps you with the present moment awareness. Uh, it brings you into the moment. Uh, it makes life more real. Yeah, it kind of it makes you alive to to the here and now rather than being kind of always in the future and the past or whatever else it is. Uh, and this is the idea behind this. Uh, but do it gently. Be gently gentle with yourself uh, because it's not necessarily easy, especially if you are quite new to the Buddhist ideas and Buddhist path. Do what comes natural. Don't push yourself too hard. If you push yourself too much with these things, it can have a kind of counter and negative effect instead. And as you do so, gradually, gradually, you start to uh, have some success with this. I'm going to try to maybe to do a death, like a small death contemplation in the meditation one of these days and see if that works. Is that a good idea? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, and if you don't want to take part in that, that's fine. You don't have to take part in it. Uh, but uh, I'm just kind of giving you a heads up at what's going to be happening, hopefully, maybe tomorrow. <laughs> okay, so that is the, um, uh, the death contemplation. Uh, and then let's move on to the next one. Uh, and for the sake of what benefit should a woman or a man, a householder or one gone forth, often reflect thus? Uh, I must be parted and separated from everyone and everything dear and agreeable to me. Beings have desire and lust in regard to those people and things that are dear and agreeable. And excited by this desire, they engage in misconduct by body, speech and mind. But when one often reflects upon this theme, the desire and lust in regard to everyone and everything dear and agreeable is either completely abandoned or diminished. Uh, it is for the sake of this benefit uh, that a woman or a man or a householder uh, or one gone forth should often reflect thus. Uh, I must be parted and separated from everyone and everything dear and agreeable to me. Uh, so this is that uh, uh, the Buddha's, one of the many ways that the Buddha recommends us to to think about impermanence. Uh, I've already talked about impermanence quite a lot and how to use that in your meditation practice. Uh, but it's also not just to be used in your meditation practice as a way of establishing right view, but it's a general outlook in life. Uh, it's a general thing that is useful to contemplate at all times uh, so that uh, you have, so that you actually uh, let go a little bit uh, of all the things in life that we accumulate or we have or even perhaps some of our relationships. You don't have have that kind of strong attachment uh, that many people have. Uh. So, and it is, it is true, because this is one of the things that makes dying so hard. Uh, yeah? You come to your deathbed uh, and you haven't really prepared. Uh, and because you haven't prepared for dying, uh, it means that when it comes, suddenly you have to let go, let go of all of these things in one go. Uh. And that is very, very hard. And sometimes you find people holding on, yeah? holding on for life. No, I'm not ready. Don't want to go. Yeah, it's too early. And it's a very painful way of dying, and it's not uh, very useful if you useful either if you want to kind of have an ideal death and perhaps kind of move on to an ideal uh, rebirth in the future. It's much better to pass away peacefully. Uh, 
yeah, having that ability to let go of all of these things. Uh, and the sooner you can learn that, uh, the younger you are when you kind of get this idea, uh, the more powerful it tends to be uh, and the more useful it actually is. Uh. So uh, this is what this is about. Because when you're dying, there's already there's so many things to let go of. Yeah, It is the, all our belongings, everything we own. Uh, on top of that, all our friends, all our relations, everything has to go. Uh, then we have to let go of so much of our mental stuff because uh, so much of our mental things are tied to this world. Our, so much of our identity yeah, is tied to this world. Our education, our position in the family, our social status, our whatever else it is that we identify with is tied to this world. Uh. And then you have to let go of your body. Huh? There's not much left. Yeah, there's a little bit left. And that's your, called your, your mind and the mind that you have created. Huh? But if you have done many bad things, and this is kind of what it says here, excited by the desires or whatever, you misconduct yourself. Huh? So you have done bad things on top of that, huh? then it gets very difficult to die. Huh? Yeah, you can feel inside. You don't really feel pure. You don't feel that you have uh, that beautiful mind that is going to go to a good destination in the future. You've done bad things and you have to let go of all the things that matter to you. It makes it very hard. Uh. And for a lot of people, uh, all they have done in their life uh, is accumulate things that belong to this world. Uh. Yeah, everything. Okay, it is about building up a certain amount of wealth. It's about having a nice family. It's about building up relationships with kind of people who are important. Building up your status and your ego. Building up a successful career. Yeah, this is what life is about for the majority of people. And all of that belongs to this world. So imagine that everything you do in this life is about those kind of things. And everything, so everything belongs to this world. Then you come to your death. Now you're going to have to leave this world. All of those things that you have done, everything you have invested in, is going to have to go. It feels terrible. It's really dying. Is really hard when you, when that is how you do things. Yeah, it's very very difficult because you feel empty. You feel like I have wasted my time. There's nothing to take with me. Why did I do all of that? Now I have to leave it all behind. Was I crazy before? That's not a good way to die, right? You think, was I crazy in, in my life? I must have been stupid. And you feel confused and you feel confounded. And that is, uh, then of course, you lack the clarity that is good to take with you into the future. Huh? And this is the problem. And then on top of that, because you were so focused on the things of this world, uh, you did bad things to accumulate that. Uh, yeah, you cheated people a little bit, you know, you, uh, the, on the contract or on the taxes or the taxes maybe. Tax, whatever it is, yeah, all of these things, and you kind of lied a little bit to make sure that you kind of got those uh, that business deal through. I remember a few years ago, I was staying in a house in a very very wealthy man. This was in Singapore, and I was I was like a spoiled child in this house, yeah. <laughs> And it's and I I don't really understand the point of all that wealth because it doesn't make you very happy. I was stayed in this enormous room for myself, big. Everything was very comfortable, but how much comfort can you have anyway? It makes a tiny bit more comfortable. Doesn't make much difference. But anyway, so I stayed in this house, and this man he has a son, and the son is going to take over the family business, obviously. And the son is really clever, obviously really good businessman as well. Yeah, it's like you are the father, you have made, built up this company, and then your son comes along, and he's just as clever, maybe more clever than you are. So he's probably very happy with his son. But his son told me that, oh, it's so hard to keep the five precepts. Yeah, when you are a businessman, uh, why? Because when you're going to sell all these projects, you cannot tell the full truth. Uh, <laughs> you have to kind of cut corners a little bit. Yeah? You have to kind of tell things that are maybe not fully lies, but kind of semi semi lies or whatever he said. I can't remember it. And it's interesting. Yeah, this is this is the thing that when you are out there, you are really busy with life. It is so easy to t cut corners uh, and to do things that aren't 100 percent appropriate. Uh, why? Because when you're in the middle of the business deals, it seems so important. Uh, I'm sure many of you have been there already, yeah, yeah, when you're in the middle of some negotiation or deal or whatever, that, that's everything that's in your head. You are intoxicated. This is what intoxication means. Yeah? You are intoxicated in this way because the greed of getting that deal through, whether it is for status or for the money or for whatever reason it is or because you are competing with the, the other business people, or whatever it is, it is you are intoxicated to some extent. So it is so easy to build up some bad karma huh, because of the things in this world being so important to you. Huh? 
And then it's terrible. Then you come to your deathbed. Everything you have done is about this world. Uh, on top of that, you have cut a few corners. You've done some things that are immoral to make you feel bad. So you have to leave everything behind. Uh, and all that you are taking with you into the future are the bad things that you have done in this life. It's terrible, isn't it? That's why death can be so difficult. Because many people, this is the case, they haven't lived that wisely. So this is why these kind of reflections are so useful. Everything in this world is problematic. It is impermanent. It is changing. It is unreliable. It's going to let you down at the very latest. It's going to let you down when you die, maybe long before that. It's incredibly useful reflection. All that is dear and pleasing to you must become otherwise. So uh, again, these things are, in a, in a sense, they are very obvious. Everyone is able to see this, uh, but it really only becomes powerful and useful when you think about it many, many times. Uh, allow it to sink in. Uh, allow it to sink in, especially maybe after uh, when you feel a bit more peaceful, after good meditation you think about it. Uh, it becomes more powerful uh, and it leaves a residue in your mind, in your heart, uh, that you then take with you into the future. Uh. So obvious, but not obvious. Uh, yeah, Clear, but not fully clear. Uh, um, uh, yeah, so there you are. That is uh, that, that one there. And it's again, it's just a lot of the things that I have talked about already, but you can see there how also that, uh, how these things, how these contemplations are very closely related to each other. Uh, because all that is dear and agreeable to me must become otherwise. Well, the time that it becomes otherwise is usually at the time of the death. So they're very closely connected to each other. Uh. Okay, let's come to the last one uh. For the sake of what benefit should a woman or a man, a householder or one gone forth, uh, often reflect thus? Uh, I am the owner of my kamma, the heir of my kamma. I have kamma as my origin, kamma as my relative, kamma as my resort. Uh, I will be the heir of whatever kamma, good or bad, that I do. People engage in misconduct by, by body, speech and mind. Uh, but when one often reflects upon this theme, such misconduct is either completely abandoned or diminished. It is for this sake, uh, for the sake of this benefit, that a woman or a man, a householder, one gone forth, should often reflect thus. I am the owner of my kama, the heir of my kama. I have kama as my origin, kama as my relative, kama as my resort. I will be the heir of whatever kama, good or bad, that I do. So uh, we are not the owners of our material possessions because the material possessions will be taken from us. Uh, we're not really the owner of our relatives and friends and uh, family members because they too will have to go one day. But kamma, you know, that is really what you own in this world. Uh, that is what you carry with you. Can't get away from it. This is the problem of kamma. So make sure you do the sort of kamma that uh, uh, you are happy with into the future. Uh, and. Um, Every time you do something which is uh, unfortunate, uh, yeah, you become the owner of that kama. So every time you do something which isn't quite right, uh, you're taking one step backwards on the Buddhist path. Uh, and can you afford one step backwards? Uh, not really. Yeah, uh, because every time you take a step backwards, you have to regain that afterwards again. Uh, and it's difficult enough to move forwards on this path as it is. Uh, so we cannot really afford to take any step backwards. Uh, of course, sometimes you will take step backwards, yeah, so occasionally that will happen, uh, and that's okay, uh, yeah, because you can't really, because we are conditioned in such a way that uh, it's impossible to always take step forwards, never to do it. Uh, but the more you reflect that you cannot really afford to take a step backward, uh, the more uh, power, the more uh, um, easy it will be for you to practice in the right way. So this is kind of the purpose of these things, uh, to remember always to do the right thing. Uh, so, uh, like making uh, salmon, yeah, for a monk and, and kind of doing that, that's a really, that's a step forward, yeah, that's a really good step forward. Yeah. So that was very, <laughs> so very nice. I'm just saying that because I, one of the, uh, the, um, the younger members of the group here kind of, she made a nice bit of salmon for me. I thought oh, that was really cool, yeah. that was very nice. Yeah. So just mentioning that. So this is kind of an example, yeah. And um, so this is uh, just an idea of the effect that these things have. But remember what I was saying before, that uh, the kind of one of the great ways of uh, 
uh, understanding kamma huh, is the idea of the effect it has on you straight away. Huh? And then you really understand the kind of the detriment of doing bad things. Yeah? If you feel what it feels like to do something which isn't quite kind, and you really feel that d directly, huh, you really understand what it means to be the owner of your kamma. Straight away it has a negative effect on you. You do something not, not, not quite kind to somebody else, and you feel bad about yourself afterwards. Uh, it's a very, very useful way of thinking about kamma. And of course the reverse is equally true. You do something kind, you feel good about yourself. Uh, it's a very useful way of looking at this. Uh, instead of thinking too much about kamma as this life and future life, uh, which is much more difficult to, to understand. So that is the um, uh, being the heir of your kamma, yeah, and make trying to make it as practical as possible. Um, so there, there you are. So let us um, uh, do the other side of this sutta, which is the, uh, the, the next five things that come here, which are just really a, uh, uh, an extension of what we have seen so far. And then you have this noble disciple reflects thus. So this is when you kind of do this reflection again and again and again, and eventually you become a noble disciple. You reflect thus, I am not the only one who is subject to old age, not exempt from old age. All beings that come and go, that pass away and undergo rebirth, are subject to old age. None are exempt from old age. As he often reflects on this theme, the path, the path is generated here. <laughs> he pursues this path, develops it and cultivates it. Uh, and as he does so, uh, the fetters <laughs> are entirely abandoned and the underlying tendencies are uprooted. Uh, so, here you can see the power of these simple reflections. Yeah, these are such uh, easy little things uh, we talk about inside sometimes in Buddhism. Uh, and this is often, uh, these are part of that insight, these very simple reflections. Uh, so what you're doing here is that you are universalizing this insight. Uh, you understand it's not just about you, it's about all beings, uh, wherever they are. Uh, they are subject to exactly the same problem. Uh, and what that means is that there is no escape in samsaric existence. Uh, it is not about being reborn in the Brahma Loka. This would have been kind of the idea of the ancient Brahmanical tradition or the Hindus in the pre present day. You get reborn in the Brahma Loka and you hang out there until the rest of eternity. But uh, in Buddhism it doesn't work. In Buddhism you always come back again, you always go around, you always come to a new place. So it is a universal principle that all beings must get older. And once you get that fully, uh, yeah, that it is a universal principle, then what happens? The path is generated. Uh. So uh, this is kind of quite unique in the suttas, the idea that all you have to do, uh, well that's not all perhaps, but what you have to do uh, Reflecting on old age is enough to generate the path. Uh, and generating the path in Buddhism means that you become a stream entry. Uh, yeah, either that or you become one who is on the path to stream entry, called the Sadhanusari or Dhammanusari, uh, just by reflecting on old age. Uh. And then, uh, once you have done that, uh, then uh, if you pursue that path and develop it, uh, and eventually you become an arahant uh, as a consequence. Uh. So that shows you the potential of uh, uh, reflecting rightly on the simple things in life. Uh, often we think that the Buddhist path is very complicated and very complex and it takes a lot of kind of difficult insights and all understandings. Uh, but actually sometimes it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the reason why we don't get it is because it has to be done in a very profound way. Uh, you have to really reflect on all that, really understand that it is a problem, uh, that it really is tied up with suffering in a very profound way, and that it is impossible to get away from it. Uh, it will always come back. You, life will always end in this way, always end with suffering. Uh, and this is really the point of this. It becomes this universal truth, uh, and then it has the power to take you through and to uh, become a stream mentor and eventually become an arahant by practicing that path. Uh, kind of astonishing, isn't it? Uh, old age is enough. Thinking of old age is enough to take you all the way. Uh. Then uh, this noble disciple reflects thus. Uh, I am not the only one who is subject to illness, uh, not exempt from illness. Uh, all beings that come and go, that pass away and undergo rebirth, uh, are subject to illness. None are exempt from illness. Uh, 
as he often reflects on this theme, the path is generated. Uh, he pursues uh, this path, develops it and cultivates it. Uh, and as he does so, the fetters are entirely abandoned and the underlying tendencies are uprooted. Uh. So the same thing again. Uh, illness is such a big problem. It always comes back, it always recurs. Uh, and ultimately, that is a sufficient reflection uh, to enable you to generate the path to become a stream enterer. Uh. Just out of curiosity, uh, as a kind of interesting little thing there in that particular sutta, it talks about all beings that come and go, that pass away and undergo rebirth. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, why? What's the difference between coming and going and passing away and undergoing rebirth? Uh, and uh, one way of understanding that, uh, and this is one of the things where the suttas are different from the Theravada tradition, is that coming and going uh, is the idea that you come and go to the intermediate state. Yeah, is the idea that when you uh, pass away, you don't kind of get reborn straight away. You go to in an intermediate existence, uh, and then eventually you get reborn from there. Uh. So you come and go between the states, uh, and then you also pass away and get reborn as well. Uh. So I take that to be a, a ref possible anyway. I haven't really studied in great de detail, but it's a possible reference to the idea of the intermediate state between two existences. Uh. And then at the very end there, you have the, the fetters are entirely abandoned. So these fetters are the ten fetters that tie us to existence. Yeah, when the fetters are gone, then you are no longer tied to rebirth, uh, and uh, it's a nice way of thinking about uh, uh, life or existence uh, that we are actually fettered. We are tied to existence. Uh, we can't get off. We are tied, and when you are tied to existence, uh, you are tied to suffering. That's really what it means. Uh, you are tied to the round. You are forced to carry on and on and on, even if it is against your will, you have no choice in the matter. Uh, it's like you are a prisoner, uh, yeah, of your, in a sense, almost of, not may maybe of your own making, but almost like of your own making, because you allow these defilements to uh, keep you tied to, this, uh, to, the, to the problems of the world. Uh. And the underlying tendencies, uh, you know, these are the kind of very profound tendencies uh, in the mind, the tendencies to desire, tendencies to aversion, tendencies to ignorance, uh, that are there in the mind at all times, even if you abandon them temporarily, uh, they are there at a very deep level and they come back again. Uh. So just to kind of uh, add that little point. Uh, so let's just continue, do the last three ones. Uh, this noble disciple reflects thus, uh, I am not the only one who is subject to death, uh, not exempt from death. Uh, all beings that come and go, that pass away and undergo rebirth, uh, are subject to death. Uh, none are exempt from death. Uh, as he often reflects on this theme, the path is generated. Uh, he pursues this path, develops it and cultivates it. Uh, and as he does so, the fetters are entirely abandoned uh, and the underlying tendencies are uprooted. Uh, that is the death contemplation here. And uh, I think uh, of the three contemplations that we have seen so far, uh, old age, illness and death, uh, the most important one is the death contemplation. Uh, because the death contemplation sort of include old age and il illness into it. Uh, and uh, it is a much starker kind of a s type of suffering because it is a very kind of important point obviously in life when you are about to die. Uh, death is very powerful in a sense that it, it, uh, uh, it is where you have to let go of the most in existence. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so this is why the death is very important. And again, it is a universal thing. You can't avoid death. You cannot get reborn in some uh, place where there is no death. Death is a universal thing. Uh, and this is one of the things that the Buddha realized on his path to awakening, uh, that these were uh, universal uh, principles. Uh, yeah, uh, there was, and this is one, what we, one of the things I mentioned before, the idea of loka vidu, of knowing the world, uh, has to do with knowing all the various possibilities of happiness and suffering, of rebirth and all of this, uh, so you know fully what is po possible in this world. Uh. So the Buddha is not just 
tied kind of to human existence, but he has the overview of the entire kind of potential of samsaric existence. And then you realize there is no escape from this. It is a universal feature, and then it becomes unacceptable. There's just too much suffering involved with this. Every time you get reborn, you make the same mistake. Every time you get reborn, you get tie yourself down in attachments to people, to things, to status, to your own body, to whatever it is. And then you're going to die. Oh no, I don't want to die. I spent so much time building all this up, for goodness sake. I'm not ready to go out of here. Then you die. Then you get reborn. You do the same thing again, building everything up. Status, money, power, greed, people, possessions. Then you're going to die. No, I just made bad karma. I'm not ready to die. You die. You get reborn again. The same thing again. After a while, I think, I'm, you know, if, imagine if you see this, if you see your past lives. Ima imagine the horror of seeing that, yeah? It's terrible. Huh? No, I've got to get out of this. This is just not, this, this cannot be true. But it is true. I've just seen it. Okay, the path opens up, bang, and you're out of here. Huh? This is what this is like. It's very stark. It's very kind of, uh, it's, you can see how you can you get repelled by this. You just reject it. You get averse, and this is why this word nibida is so powerful. You get this real aversion towards the entire round of existence. You chuck it all out, and that is where the craving for all of that it goes. And then that is how the liberation from the path happens. It's not very mystical at all. Yeah, once you kind of get the idea, it's pretty kind of obvious in many ways. It's just that you need the depth of mind, the depth of stillness and peace to be able to see these things. That is kind of the hardest part uh, to get to. Uh, but the rest is uh, the kind of insight, the outlook is actually fairly, it's not that hard to, to get as, as, as long as you're willing to accept the idea of rebirth, that is, uh, that is kind of the sometimes the stumbling block for some people. Uh. So anyway, let's uh, have a look at the uh, last two. Uh, this noble disciple reflects thus. Uh, I'm not the only one who must be parted and separated from everyone and everything dear and agreeable. All beings that come and go, that pass away and undergo rebirth, uh, must be parted and separated from everyone and everything dear and agreeable. Uh, as he often reflects on this theme, uh, the path is generated. You become a stream enterer. Uh, once you become a stream enterer, you know what the Noble Eightfold Path is. You internalize it, becomes part of your psychology, part of who you are. For that reason, you pursue that path, you develop it and cultivate it. And as it does so, the fetters are entirely abandoned and the underlying tendencies are uprooted. This noble disciple reflects thus, I am not the only one who is the owner of one's kama, the owner of my kama, who has kama as uh, one's origin, kama as one's relative, kama as one's resort. Uh, who will be the heir of whatever kamma, good or bad, that one does. Uh, all beings that come and go, that pass away and undergo rebirth, uh, are owners of the kamma, heirs of the kamma, all have kamma as their origin, kamma as a relative, kamma as their resort. Uh, all will be the heirs of whatever kamma, good or bad, that they do. Uh, as he often reflects on this theme, the path is generated. Uh, he pursues this path, develops it and cultivates it. As he does so, the fetters are entirely abandoned and the underlying tendencies are uprooted. So, uh, there you are, these uh, five uh, reflections. Uh, and uh, of these ones, in my experience, the uh, most important ones are maybe that the third and the fourth one uh, are very, very useful reflections. Uh, uh, and the third one and fourth one are very closely related to each other. One entails the other and the other entails the one uh, they, because they are two sides of the same coin, really. Uh, and uh, in a sense, you could say that all of them are very closely related to each other and they are the slightly different angles from which to understand the same basic point. Uh, yeah, that, uh, 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 that life has certain problems, serious problems, uh, and this kind of helps you to clarify your view and then propel you forward. Uh, 
And the more clearly you see all of these things, uh, the less problems you're going to have in your meditation. This is kind of the interesting thing about this. This really is about having right view, if you think about it. Uh, this is a right view exercise, uh, the Ujjukaditi, the straight view about reality, seeing life for what it actually is. Uh, and what I saw nice about these things is that in many ways they are so obvious. Uh, we know they are true already, and because we know they are true, it is kind of natural for us to uh, perhaps develop, develop them further. Uh, you will find that there is resistance sometimes to develop these things uh, because they go against the grain, uh, but because they, you know they are true, uh, it is hard to resist. Yeah? You all still feel that you should develop these things because otherwise you're just being foolish. Uh, there's no point in not doing it just because it is a little bit painful. Uh, you know that in the long run this is really going to bear fruit. Uh, so you have to uh, be willing to kind of look at things in the long run, uh, and then uh, you will get the cons get the results of these things. Uh. So uh, uh, try these things out a little bit. Uh, use them as part of your contemplation. People underestimate the importance of contemplation in Buddhism. Uh, I often quote a sutta that is from the Anguttara Nikaya twos, uh, and this sutta says that there are two powers uh, on in Buddhism, two powers on the Buddhist path. Uh, one of those powers is called the powers of reflection. Uh, the other one is called the power of development. Uh, now the power of development is the bhavana or bhavana bala. Bhavana means usually is a, a word for meditation practice uh, and it is defined right there as the four jhanas uh, or the seven factors of awakening. Uh, because that is all about meditation, it's all about samadhi. Uh, yeah? So the Bhavana Bala, the power of uh, development, is all about jhanas and meditation. Uh. But the Pati Sankhana Bala, the power of reflection, uh, that is the power that makes you overcome the, hi the hindrances, uh, overcome the bad states of mind. Uh. Yeah, so if you want to overcome the hindrances, uh, if you want to overcome the defilements of the mind, uh, the main thing you have to do is to reflect. Uh, reflect in the right way. Uh. Meditation can be helpful, it can be something to kind of give you a bit of support, but actually the way to overcome these problems is to reflect in the right way. Get that right view, see things, as, see the world as it actually is, and the more you recline in that way, the more ability you will have to overcome these things that hinder you in your meditation practice. The defilements, the five hindrances, the unwholesome states of mind will tend to die down. It's very interesting, yeah, how to how these things um, uh, are are described sometimes, and sometimes it is not obvious, and sometimes we tend to think about these things perhaps not in quite the right way. Yeah. So anyway, I'm going to stop there. Yeah. So uh, please uh, just carry on and enjoy yourself, and uh, see if you can find a little bit more of peace and quiet. Uh, it is quite nice here, actually, quite a nice atmosphere, except when you get the fellow with the horn down on the street there. <laughs> but, uh, uh, anyway, so please enjoy yourself and we'll see you back again at 4 o'clock and we'll continue, continue then. Uh.